Good morning, Kyle. How are you doing? Hi. Good morning, ma'am. I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. This is the first time I've ever seen you in my class, ever. How are you? Yeah, I just missed my group two class this week, so I just decided to catch up everything oh, on okay. the group three one. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, today is, <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult because I also have COVID, so I'm at home. <clears throat> oh God, okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit difficult today. I wasn't supposed to have the class, but um, okay. we have to have it. Um, let's just wait a few minutes to see who else joins us in, in the lecture. So we'll start at 20 past eight, okay? Okay, 100%. guys let's get started for today um hi pd hi timba thanks for joining just to let you know i have covid so i might not be too well in the lecture and i might cough a little bit um but yeah um let's get started with our lecture for today so today we are actually starting let me start at the beginning actually today we are actually starting a, a new chapter so we are on chapter four four of the textbook and we're going into media and culture which is a South African perspective so at the end of this lesson we're going to be or we would have known about the history of culture studies decoding and evolution of influence post-colonialism post-modernism and post-feminism and also we will talk about some examples of these in the South African context. Okay, so we see that theory does play a part in um, different parts of the textbook. It's not confined to, to what we learned in just chapter three. 
So on pages 103 to 119 or 18, I think it is of the textbook for your reference. Sorry, let me just do something here. I didn't remove the setting. So there we go. I've, so nobody can put the cameras on now. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about South Africa and South Africa's culture. So we know that South Africa is very culturally diverse. We have many different cultures and it's an integral part of who we are. And it's very important because of how we relate to each other in various contexts. It shapes how we think, how people think about society, our opinions, etc. You will find that South Africans um, struggle a little bit when they go abroad, mostly because the culture is very different. Okay, when I was living in Asia, all the South Africans would find it very difficult because we didn't know how to relate to a country or to people that were homogeneous, meaning that there was just one race because in South Africa, we have many different races and we get along with each other. So culture brings people meaning and influences the development of their identities and their political views as well. It encompasses people's day-to-day -day activities. As we know, when we realize freedom, Okay, in 1994, <clears throat> there was a political shift and it restructured many of the different parts of society and culturally as well. Apartheid came to an end and there was an increase in globalization and a new understanding of the world and South Africa's place in the world and South Africans in general. And um, <clears throat> with all this happening, there was an effect on the media, how the media relates to the new context, okay, of South Africa, and also the context in which it was created, and, um, and how it still is created, disseminated, and consumed. Okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of culture studies. So we must realize when we talk about culture studies that academics tend to disagree about what it actually is. It's new, but it's not the first attempt to understand human culture. Anthropology and sociology have also influenced or focused on the influence of culture in, in terms of social structures and communities. And when we talk about cultural studies, we draw on different elements, including sociology and anthropology to formulate some of the theories of cultural studies. So when we talk about cultural studies, it, it's a field of analysis that focuses on political and social dynamic of culture, okay? And it attempts to define the characteristics of culture and determine its historical foundations. So why is the culture the way it is? What was the history behind the culture that it is the way it is today? So researchers in cultural studies examine how cultural practice are linked to wider systems of power and categories such as race, class, and gender. Cultural theories combine different politically oriented approaches, including post-colonial studies, critical race theories, feminist theory, post-modernist studies, and post-structuralism. So we're going to do most of these except for critical race theory. Cultural studies considers social practice in order to understand how and why we adopt trends or ideas and reject others or why we gravitate towards certain groups and shy away from others, and how or why we perform our roles in society. Any questions? No questions? All righty, let's continue.
So in order for us to get a better understanding of the different cultures in society, we need to understand a little bit more about some of the theories in cultural studies. The theoretical movements we're going to focus on are post-colonialism, post post-modernism, post-structuralism, and post-feminism. So as I said previously in other classes, when I talked about theories, when we talk about the theories that come with the word post, it implies that these were created in a response to what came before. Okay. And the prefix post also suggests new, a new perspective on old ideas. So yes, sometimes you can find it can be in contradictory to the original theory. Sometimes it can be a build up uh, or it builds upon the original theory. Okay. So just keep that in mind. I noticed that uh, with like postmodernism, poststructuralism, et cetera, there was some kind of um, opposing uh, thought between the original ideology and the new, or theory, original theory and the new theory. So all these movements that we're speaking about are, occur in a globalized and technologically orientated world, world where there's a blurring between continents, cultures, societies, etc. as we did speak about globalization in the beginning of the semester. So post-colonialism, who wants to tell me what's post-colonialism? And why would post-colonialism have an effect on our culture anyway? Um, I think post-colonialism is where it is the way that they ruled the country before or during apartheid. They, they were still the European when they were ruling, um, for example, South Africa during apartheid the rules and everything that was happening was under them. So I think that's post-colonialism. Okay, good, okay. <clears throat> so post-colonialism is the period following Western colonialism, okay? So it's after when we realized freedom and we need to draw a distinction between the post-colonial period as a temporal aftermath of the colonial period a post-colonial theory as a critical aftermath. So a temporal aftermath refers to an identifiable time period which begins when a previously colonized country is liberated from colonial rule. A critical aftermath is referred to as a way of thinking about and critiquing colonialism and its legacies, okay? So just basically terminology that you need to familiar, familiarize yourself with. So, okay, good. Good Pindi in the chat. So studies in post-colonialism rethink the way that people are represented in history, especially those people who were oppressed by colonial powers and different types of imperialism. So we need to think, how were these people represented during this time? Okay. Like, were they even in the media at all in South Africa? Things like that, okay? Were they represented correctly, et cetera? So it, it also considered how these oppressed people resisted their oppression and how colonial powers helped to shape the post-colonial societies that emerged after they withdrew. Okay, there's a very lovely picture and it says Afrique and they're cutting up the wonderful cake of Africa into different pieces for each of them, not taking into consideration the different cultures and languages, they're just cutting it up whichever way they want. All right, so in the post-colonial post -colonial studies reader Ashcroft et al. note, the term post-colonial colonial is resonant with all the ambiguity and complexity of the different cultural experiences it implicates and it addresses all aspects 
of the colonial processes from the beginning of colonial contacts. Colonialism refers to the act of acquiring and setting up colonies and imperialism is the policy of forcefully imposing a country's influence, customs and power on a colonized country through military intervention or other means. So remind me again, what were the, or who were the main colonizers in Africa? Well, let's the talk- British men. Okay, in, I said Africa, but let's make it simpler. In South Africa, who were the main colonizers? Uh, Ma'am? Yeah? I'm not, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but apparently, uh, the Arabs were the first people to like settle in Africa. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, I'm, I'm, it could be true, especially in the north of Africa, but I was talking about South Africa. I changed it to South Africa. Yeah, ma'am, I mean South Africa because there's a theory, I don't know if it's true or not, that the word kafir is actually a, a, yeah, an Arab Arab. word. Yes, it is an Arab yes. word. But it so is an Arab word, but that's, that doesn't mean that they were the first colonizers. So, yes. Man, wasn't it the Europeans? Yeah, so guys, remember that first the Dutch were here and then the British came here. So we must draw a little bit on South African history. As far as my knowledge goes, South Africa was not colonized by any Arab nation. Uh, if we if we want to know more about um, you know the influence of Islam etc we'd look more to the north of Africa because it's very close to the Middle East okay so those countries there would have more Muslim influence uh, than in in the south of Africa so yes first it was the Dutch and then it was the British in South Africa. That's why we have Dutch and British influences in South Africa. Okay, Pindi, do a little bit more research about um, the Arabs. Um, as far as my knowledge is concerned, we were never colonized by any Arab uh, nation. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, cool. So, yes. So both of these strong forces of imperialism and colonialism assumed many forms and impacted many diverse cultures and societies around the world. Any questions? No, man. So, as the form of colonization and imperialism took many forms, so did the process of decolonization. So two of the most notable periods of decolonization are the British disengagement and the liberation movements of the 1960s and 1970s in Africa and other colonies. So yes, in Africa, there was a real struggle and fight for freedom, even after the Second World War, unfortunately. So the liberation movements in Africa and elsewhere provided the foundations upon which the theories of post-colonialism first took form, although their origins can be traced back even further. The processes of thinking through the political, cultural, and economic liberation that these movements set in place helped to establish many of the principles of decolonization. So these include, first of all, rewriting history to include the narratives of the colonized. So previously, the thought was that the colonizer is a hero and they were portrayed in heroic terms. They came here to save the people. That was the original ideology that was propagated by these people. So, they were saying that the colonized people, or sorry, so whilst they did this, the colonized people were misrepresented and they were obviously margin, marginalized. So the British colonies, in the British colonies, the dominant narrative represented the British colonizers as heroes 
who brought civilization to primitive life, like I said. They came here, they brought religion, they brought their food, they brought their culture, okay? They, they wanted to make us civilized, okay? Because we were not civilized. Um, and the, the colonized native inhabitants, inhabitants were primitive and uncultured. So just this was the ideology and the thoughts that was portrayed. Post-colonial writers and critics aim to correct these narratives by emphasizing the importance of a diverse cultural identity. So we need to understand diversity, which was not present during the colonial area. They didn't understand diversity. They wanted, if they were British colonizers, they wanted the, the British colonies to be like the British. And that's why we are like the British essentially. And the same for the other colonies, if they were Portuguese, if they were French, etc. So these post-colonial writers are trying to change that narrative by saying that cultural diversity is important and it is important and it is interesting. So this helps them to ch challenge narratives that portray Europeans as a pinnacle, I think it was here, of civilization. So this is what they were saying, like when we show different parts of Africa or Africans uh, and the cultural diversity, it doesn't only mean that the Europeans were a civilized race, etc. Also, I've done a lot of studies on, on Africa in my previous uh, degree. So there are lots of ways that Africa was advanced, but they were just doing things a little bit differently than the rest of the world. And for this reason, because of this difference, it was regarded as uncivilized, but it was actually not. There was a lot of critical thinking uh, going on within the minds of African people. Questions, comments? So, European colonizers sought to erase indigenous cultures and languages in favor of their own, which we did speak about. And in post-colonial societies, nationhood and nationalism tend to be cultivated around patriotic ideas of a nation's cultural, political, and social identity. Formerly oppressed people sought control not only over the territorial boundaries and economic forms of establishment, by imperial powers, but also over their culture, language, and history. So every day people were fighting to speak their language, to preserve their culture. And this was important in these territories, okay? So Tordoff identifies four common traits shared by the colonies in Africa that gained independence. Firstly, they stood under colonial rule was brief in comparison to their pre-colonial history. They were all ruled by one of the European colonial powers. They were economically poor and dependent on export and international markets. And they sought to establish an independent identity as a nation state, which was often complicated by the diversity of their population. Yes, and it's still true in some African countries today where we see they have a lot of something called sectarian violence. Sectarian violence is where different sects of the population fight with each other. And this was because when the Europeans came to Africa, they divided the land any way they wanted, not taking into consideration the cultural lines. It wasn't cut along cultural lines. They didn't take it into consideration. That's why you'll find two different sects of people, uh, a sect, please notice the word that I'm saying, sect. So two different sects of people would, uh, would be raging a war against each other for this reason and because of limited resources as well. So when thinking through the idea of post-colonialism in South Africa, it's important to first understand what post-apartheid means. Apartheid in South Africa was a system of institutionalized rape, 
racial segregation that defined the political and social landscape of the country, and the historical institution of apartheid and the transition to democracy that took place sets South Africa apart from other African countries. So yes, South Africa was a very special case in many different ways. Okay, so South Africa was the first country to achieve independence. <coughs> Excuse me, just give me a second guys. Okay, <clears throat> so, so even though we achieved independence, it was not the end of the institutionalized colonial, colonial state. Okay, so what does that mean? We still had white minority rule and we still, it still pers persisted through segregation legislation. Okay, so there, there's also something called neocolonialism, if you want to know, which means that the, the colonial power has a, still has a very heavy influence on the colonized country uh, because of mainly economic reasons. And because of economic reasons, it's still tied to the colonial power, which a lot of African countries are in that position today, especially with France. So, after 1948, the ideology of segregation between races was form formally institutionalized apartheid. In 1994, after years of liberation struggles and negotiations, South Africa held its first democratic election and the ANC under Nelson Mandela took up the governments of, governance of the country, instituted, instituted a new constitution and instituted the, the period following this transition is referred to as post apartheid. After 1994, South Africa became known as the Rainbow Nation. This concept was created to represent the racial and cultural diversity of the country while promoting unity. People born during or after 1994 became known as the one generation. And these terms define the post apartheid era as an era free from oppression. However, in recent years, commentators have shifted their focus from the idea of post apartheid unity to a more traditionally post colonial interrogation of the concept of itself. So, what I want to know from you guys is what do you think of this idea of the rainbow nation? Is it true? Do we, are, are we actually living in a rainbow nation in South Africa? Um, I can't hear you, ma'am. You sound like you're far from the mask, from the mic. Oh, but why do you tell me when I finish speaking? Why not stop me and tell me? Can you hear me better now? Hello? I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you, ma'am. So my question... Yeah, I can hear you, ma'am. So my question is, what do you think about this idea of the rainbow nation? Is it something that's true? Is it represented correctly in society? Do you see it, this rainbow nation? It depends on the areas, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> it depends where you are and people around. Some people, they go with this rainbow nation thing, but there are some people are still not into it. They live like doing the back in the face era. And you know, the rainbow nation is about uh, each other, but people, they just uh, care about themselves, not anyone else. And rainbow nation is not like that. It's supposed to talk about one another. Okay. Anyone else wants to say something? Yes, Pindi? Um, I would like to agree with him, Paul, because um, in recent years, as we've been discussing in class, we're becoming more and more individualized. So 
the idea of the rainbow nation is I don't want to say it's fading, it's faded, but it's slowly starting to fade because people are focusing more on their individual improvement than the improvement of community and unity. I guess. Okay, good. Okay, those are good opinions. So we're going to discuss it a little bit more as we go along. And it's interesting. Okay, so rainbowism and narratives of unity through diversity are being challenged by referring to persistent racial discrimination, lingering colonial legacies and questions about land ownership. So here's what we're saying in this instance, that even though we have these wonderful terms, do they really exist? Because we do find so much racial discrimination in many different areas in South, in South Africa, in different policies that we have, okay? And it's, it's not just one way, it works both ways recently. And we even spoke a little bit about how the tables of race can turn when we spoke about uh, the EFF previously. So also about what kind of lingering colonial legacies do we have in South Africa? And we had them until people fought them, which was very interesting. Okay. We also need to think about the amount of inequality or inequalities rather in South Africa and what people face on a daily basis in terms of resources and basic, uh, their basic needs being met. Okay, so the term culture is not easily defined because it, its meaning depends on context. Culture is socially constructed. So what does it mean? Culture is socially constructed. So it, yes, PD. Oh, ma'am, I, I, I wanted to attempt to answer that question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think it's when people formulate their own practices and they pass them down to generate, pass them down from generation to generation. Yes, exactly. So culture is something that's, it's formed, okay? For example, in South Africa, we have a specific culture, okay? That we formed all together. So it develops when a group of people live together and form beliefs or traditions and it changes as those beliefs and tra traditions change. So it's constantly changing, right? So for example, we, for I know some people in, in my society, many years ago, they could have been racist, okay? But as time moved on, and we are progressive, people have become more progressive in their thought, the kids changed and then it's they've lost their ability, okay? And things are different, so it changes. So two of the most important aspects of culture are the ability of human beings to construct, to build, and the ability to use language. So we see that languages are very important. Communication, invention, and reinvention are crucial to the formation of cultures. Cultures are not static, but constantly changing, as I said, okay? So they're influenced by particular pol socio-political moments in time, but they in turn also influence the material circumstances in which they are embedded. So yes, it works both ways, but we find that politics heavily influences culture as well. If we accept the idea that cultures are shaped by the circumstances in which they emerge, then the concept of hybridity in post-colonial theory becomes a useful way for us to think through the effect of colonialism on culture. So yes, there are various instances of this hybridity that we find, okay? So example, South Africa is a very, very mixed hybrid country. We have different cultures, okay? And we have, we know that Westernization has a huge influence on Indian and African societies in particular, and the other way around as well, okay? I don't know if in America they have such, if Indian society and African society has a, a big influence uh, or if Bollywood has a big influence, etc. Okay, but I know definitely in South Africa that they have an influence on us, but also from the, the, 
the colonizers had a huge influence on us as well. That's why we all speak in English instead of another language. So South Africa is a country that was built through the hardships of violent struggle. In post-apartheid South Africa, culture has taken on a new significance. So African cultures were suppressed by the apartheid government and now recognized and, and cultures that were suppressed by the apartheid government are now recognized and openly practiced. New cultures and subcultures have emerged, which we are going to talk about in next week's lecture. It's very interesting. We can see the country as a space alive with possibilities for invention and reinvention, both culturally and politically. British and Dutch colonialism have transformed or eroded many of the traditional cultures of pre-colonial times. Yes, they've changed a lot of the things, even the foods that we eat or the foods that were created. Okay, the words, the languages, okay. So there's this Combesi, what is it called? Combesi Afrikaans, Combesi Afrikaans, okay? For example, that many um, colored people speak, for example, and there's influence from so many different uh, various cultures, Malay, Afrikaans, Khoisan, et cetera. So the apartheid government adopted and developed many of the oppressive institutions associated with imperial rule in order to construct the institutionalized racism and racial legislation that characterized its rule. In the 80s and, 80s and 90s, as apartheid ended in South Africa, cultural, culture and cultural studies were largely preoccupied with resistance politics. What is resistance politics? You can guess and make a mistake. Pindi, do you want to answer? Or was it an old hand? No, uh, can I try, ma'am? Yes. I think it's when uh, people challenge the, t the status quo of a country. <coughs> Good. So yes, they were fighting. We call them the resistance fighters because they were fighting for freedom, OK? So that's what we're talking about there when we talk about resistance politics, they wanted freedom. So as South Africa made its transition to democracy, the idea of resistance and reinvention was central to imagining a new way of navigating an integrated racially and culturally diverse population. After the year 2000, a shift in South African cultural studies suggested that we were moving away from the politics of resistance to one of potential as the country began to imagine the future from the perspective of a democratic society, not like where we were before. At the same time, new languages of resistance have emerged among the born free generation as they begin to question the legacies that they have inherited, as well as the effectiveness of the struggle for emancipation. All right, so guys, let's stop with this meeting here and we're gonna go to the next meeting. I'm going to put the link in the chat now in case you don't have it. So let me give it to you. Okay, there you go. So uh, please go into the second meeting and I will see you there. Cool. I'll just wait a few minutes to see who else joins us, if anyone does.
Okay. So, can you think of examples of the youth challenging these problematic inherited institutions? Yes, Pindi. Um, I would say that um, I noticed that a lot of youth are challenging some of the policies that were set in place when President Nelson Mandela was put into power and the, the validity of the negotiations that took place, the details of the negotiations that took place mm -hmm. when South Africa was transitioning from apartheid to a rainbow nation, as we call it. Okay, cool. So yeah, what about like the, so let's think about this. So if you look on page 107, they talk a lot about the roads must form movement. Now we were inheriting these uh, colonial structures. Now who was the Cecil John Rhodes? Okay. He served as a prime minister of the Cape Colony and Rhodes firmly believed in British imperialism and the idea that British values, politics and culture should be adopted all over the world. So now we had these, the statue of him, okay? Was it correct? Because he actually, he um, did improve the South African comedy, economy but it came at the expense of the exploitation of the African people. So it was, we still had this legacy of this person who was a, a racist, okay? Who believed in British imperialism. And I mean, this was at a, a, a university. So what kind of message was it sending out to the students of this university? What do you think? if we still had the statue? Um, I think it's, um, if we still had the statue, it was gonna be something like, uh, we still, we need to uh, learn Africans, we need to go with the roles of like, academically, how the, this guy um, put the roles on how we should learn and um, as 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 we know that it, this this um Mr. Roth was was an African um It's not an African. He's British. No, but he, yeah, but he was he was uh, ruling based on uh European Western culture. Let me just put it like that. Everything that he does he was a Western in a Western culture. So he was not considering the African. Cultures. Yeah, so exactly. So guys, this, the statue, it was symbolic. Okay. So it's symbolic of the way the, it, it could have been symbolic of, uh, of the way the institution uh, still has some form of institutionalized racism in its policies. For example, an example, which, which in some instances could be true. So I mean, if you had to go to university and you, you're an educated person and you see this statue and you think, why is this statue here? You know, this person was not good in our history. Why does it need to be a, why do we need to know this person? So it's, it's symbolic and it could, it still, it shows the preservation of this kind of ideology in the present time which would definitely still have an effect on people and the way that people relate to each other. Okay, so we need to think about these things, uh, about these people that, okay, they were present in our history, but what kind of effect did they have and what is symbolic um, of the, uh, or in the statues or any any anything else that we see okay it it actually it constructs our 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 reality okay it constructs our reality which we must understand so a global conversation 
around race and racial inequalities taking place not only in previously colonized countries, but also in the African diaspora, referring to people who have left their home countries, not uh, or moved abroad, whether by choice or by force. So the, the African diaspora is a worldwide collective of people who are descended from African people. The diaspora has its origins in slavery and colonialism, which forcibly removed African people from their countries and transported them to places like America, where they were treated like property and worked and forced to work as slaves. In more recent years, the African diaspora has come to refer to people to have immigrated from Africa to other parts of the world, okay? So yes, we see that it has two different kind of connotations here when we talk about the word, the African diaspora. Questions before we go on to postmodernism? No, ma'am. Cool. So let's go into postmodernism and talk about it. And then we'll talk about how it relates to South Africa. So postmodernism is a, theory, a theoretical movement that originated in the late 20th century. And its concept of the interrogation of, sorry, its interrogation of the concept of reason. It's coupled to critique the ideology and the role that ideology plays in maintaining economic and political power. The lens to which people's, I just, I don't know why it does this. I just wanna do something here. Not sure if I, that's my mistake. Let's just do that. Okay, so. The lens through which people see the world is made up of a number of different aspects, including their culture, beliefs, and values. A critique of ideology looks at the ways in which these different elements are constructed or maintained. Such a critique also seeks to understand the role that these elements play in how people construct and interact with their social and political circumstances. While the exact date of or origin of the postmodern movement is debated, we can roughly trace its beginnings to the end of the Second World War. However, it only achieved large scale popularity in the 1960s. Postmodernists rejected all notions of a universal truth, dispersed more conventional empirical approaches to understanding society, and firmly believed that rationality was inherently a misleading concept. So here we're just breaking down theory of what it actually is. Postmodernism as a set of ideas is largely a reaction to the values and ideas of the modern period of Western and more specifically European history. The modern period occurs roughly from the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century to the mid 20th century. Technology brought about the industrial revolution, which then resulted in the expansion of cities and industries. More and more people moved from the country to the city in search for work. And the cultural period between the late 19th and mid 20th century, modernism is also famous for the experimentation in the arts. Modernist philosophy was centered on moving away from traditional and classic values. And the term modern refers to many different periods throughout history and implies a contrast between a recent period and an earlier period. Modernity implies progressing, progress moving forward and is most often associated with the 19th and 20th century world of political democracy, capitalism, urbanization, mass literacy, mass media, anti-traditionalism, and so on. Finally, modernism refers to a movement in the creative arts that challenged what was consider, considered the acceptable fixed forms of art and literature by using new experimental forms and new mediums to better represent the chaos and of the modern condition in an increasingly industrializing and globalizing world. Any questions? So 
So yes, once again, theory is theory, unfortunately. So some definitions between the three modern, is the current age, which is different from the historical period that has come before the contemporary time or history. Modernity is the progress made in the 19th and 20th century, social, political, and technological areas, for example, the mass media, democracy, and capitalism. And modernism is a movement in the creative arts that challenged existing norms, used experimental forms, and explored the chaos of the modern world. So let's talk a little bit about modernism versus postmodernism. So whilst modernism still believed in the value of rational thinking, science and reason, postmodernism modernism believed in irrationality and incoherence of the everyday. Okay, so we can see there's some contrast between the two. Modernists advocated a distinction between high art and pop culture, while the postmodernists blurred the boundaries between what could not be, what could and could not be considered art. Modernists also believed that there was a connection between past and present and that life could be viewed objectively from the standpoint of universal truths and ethics. Postmodernists, on the other hand, saw no connection between the past and the present and believed that past events are essentially irrelevant to how we perceive the present. Postmodernists argue that the scientific worldview and the notion of universal rational, rational thought advocated during the modern period was often used to oppress and subjugate people. <coughs> Excuse me. Questions? So, in post-apartheid South Africa, postmodernist theory has proven useful in navigating new emerging, emerging cultural landscapes. Postmodernism recognizes that the world is made up of multiple and diverse cultures and also promotes an increased awareness of the interests of minority groups, class struggle, and, and the drive toward both individual identities and group identities. Globalization and the advancements of technology have also changed the way that we communicate with each other in, in, and interact with politics and society. In the postmodern moment, the function of culture evolved to occupy a more central position in the organization of present day societies, whose contemporary culture can be at least in part characterized as postmodern. Postmodernism involves dissolving the boundaries, not only between high and low cultures, but also between different cultural forms, such as tourism, art, education, photography, television, music, sports, shopping, and architecture. We can see here that culture in the postmodern sense has a very broad and varied definition. The term culture can take on a number of meanings. It can refer to the knowledge and characteristics of specific groups of people, including their religion, social habits, language, music, and art. It can also refer to shared patterns of behavior, beliefs, and interactions that are formed through socialization. Socialization basically means how we acquire our thoughts, ideas, beliefs and patterns through family, through friends, through schooling, through education systems, etc. Questions, comments? No, ma'am. So while the early modern period was characterized by its promotion of a largely European idea of culture across the globe, Postmodernism recognizes multiculturalism, the idea that the world is made up of all kinds of cultures. In South Africa, recognizing multiculturalism was an important step in dismantling the legacy of apartheid. In an attempt to show recognition for South Africa's cultural diversity, the new government under the leadership of Mandela recognized new Ele sorry, recognized 11 official languages, 
Zulu Kosa Afrikaans English to two men that Tswana, Tsonga, Pedi, Swati, and Ndebele. The move toward nation building was joined to the idea of multiculturalism and the idea of the rainbow nation. The idea of the rainbow nation in many ways is a postmodern concept since it has always been hard to define and like many postmodern concepts remains ambiguous. Questions? So let's talk a little bit more about South African examples and Afrofuturism on page 112. So Afrofuturism is a cultural aesthetic as well as a philosophy of science and history that seeks to investigate and explore the connections between Africa and the African diaspora culture and technology. Okay, <clears throat> so we're talking more about these connections that can be felt from the heart of Africa throughout people living all over the world that are African, of African descent. The Afrofuturist aesthetic combines elements of science fiction, black history and magic realism. Sorry, I just gonna note this. to investigate and interrogate both the contemporary moment and historical events. In this sense, Afrofuturism combines both postmodern and post-colonial philosophies. The term Afrofuturism was coined by Mark Derry to describe the post-war aesthetic practices deployed by African-American artists who combined elements of African culture with American technoculture. One of the key features of postmodernism is that it is formed in and negate, negotiates its way through the information age using cross-continental communication and technology. Questions? So you can read a little bit more about that on page 112 if you're interested in knowing more about. Afrofuturism because Black Panther is an example of Afrofuturism. <coughs> okay, let's go on to post structuralism. So, post structural thought is a reaction to liberal humanist ideas about the self about the self, one's identity as fixed, whole, and rational. Post-structuralists reject the idea of the self as unified and whole, arguing that the self is constructed through various conversations with the surrounding world. Post-structuralists also deny the existence of human nature or, or an essential core self and argue that we only come to know and understand ourselves through the medium of language. Post-structuralism considers language as the medium through which we navigate, structure, and experience our world. Things, tables, chairs, or other objects that make up our physical reality and actions do not contain meaning in themselves, but rather obtain meaning through language. The word table is not a table, okay? Like we did speak about in last week's lecture, if you remember correctly. <coughs> post-structuralism like post-modernism and post-feminism is difficult to define because it incorporates a diverse range of philosophies and resists a single definition. However, in simple terms at the heart of post-structuralism thought is the idea that social reality is produced by language and it varies across cultures and across time. Yes, PD. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I was wondering if we could relate this uh, this idea of a table. The word table is not a table. The actual table is the referent, and yeah. then the word table is a signifier, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Just for your understanding. 
definitely that's definitely what it is good i'm glad i explained it to you well enough that you understood that excellent okay cool uh any other questions I know, ma'am. I just wanted to clarify that one. Okay. So, structuralism describes the world in terms of a structured logic. They viewed individual objects as inevitably belonging to a larger whole. Structuralism emphasizes structures and processes that inform the construction of social reality and the way we interact. Language was seen as the key in which, in, to which allows us to unlock the creation and construction of meaning in our everyday lives. Meaning can be found within the text, which was by nature created in a logical and unified man manner. Text referred not only to actual written text, but to the narratives that made sense of situations, objects, and actions. Structuralism is rule-based, organized, and attempts to apply a rational order to the world. Post-structural thinkers challenge the idea that words have structured meanings. Okay, this Jacques Derrida did this by suggesting that meaning could be found in the differences between concepts within the structure of language itself, and that these concepts could contain multiple meanings. Post-structuralism rejects the structuralist idea of an underlying and and define system that explain how the world works. Post-structuralism places even more importance on the idea that language constructs our reality. Unlike the structuralists, however, post-structuralists view language as unstable and constantly changing. And then we get to this word of the rainbow nation. I just want to find out where this is because I actually do want you to read about this. Yes, yeah, on page 114. Okay, at the bottom. So the idea of the rainbow nation was popularized by Archbishop Desmond Tutu in 1994. And it described a newly formed democratic South Africa characterized by its multicultural multiracial and multilingual social and political landscape. Post-structuralists argue that identities are made and remade through discourse and of the rainbow nation. And this was one that was attempted to stratify, strengthen a unified South African national identity. One that views diversity as a point of pride and progression. <coughs> The idea of the rainbow nation contained the promise of the future, as well as describing a newly shaped president that included people from every part of the country, regardless of class, race, gender, or cultural practices. So yes, this idea of the, def uh, of the rainbow nation was definitely a post-structuralist concept. So although South Africa has come a long way since the end of apartheid, many argue that the idea of the rainbow nation is a myth designed to promote a false sense of identity in a country that remains divided in many ways. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Is this idea of this rainbow nation actually true? Okay. The idea of the rainbow nation is not unlike similar nation building ideas elsewhere in the world, like the American dream. It is intended to act as a master narrative, a universal idea that is told through a single narrative of development and that attempts to provide a cohesive shared identity for a diverse population. The rainbow nation then becomes an active component in nation building, identity construction and national imagination. Post-structuralism challenges the idea that some narratives, such as the narrative of the Rainbow Nation, are more important or powerful than others, or that one story or description of a country's social pol political state is a true master narrative that defines everything. So, yes, this idea 
it's not really that true in reality, like the American dream is not really that true in reality, okay? Because a lot of people are dying and suffering in America, okay? as opposed to what we would like to think that it is in America. And it is a very capitalistic country. So this is important for our understanding of how narratives and ideas work in society. In recent commentary, the idea of the rainbow nation is being challenged because of the lingering effects of apartheid that prevent the idea of a fair and equal or fair, equal and progressive society. It is not realized in South Africa. People are suffering, people are in poverty, people can't afford basic necessities. Okay. In a study conducted in 2007, the South African Regional Government Network reported that 24% of the... <coughs> Guys, let me drink some water, please. This COVID is killing me. Okay, so 24% so of the South African population earned below the poverty line. And we did speak about this in previous classes, especially when we were on campus. And I was even reading an article yesterday in the newspaper that was talking about how companies are now even pay paying people less and less, which is very, very sad. Okay. Most of the country is still subject to low quality health care and education, which is true. And racial inequality still persists with the majority of the African population. I don't like to say black population, African population holding very little of the country as well. So yes, we need to think of all these ideas when uh, constructing our view of this idea of the rainbow nation and if it's actually true. Questions, comments? Uh, ma'am? Yes. I have a question about the assignment, ma'am. Okay, let me finish so, the lecture first. Oh, okay. okay. So let's go on to post feminism. So the post in post-feminism is somewhat misleading as it can suggest that feminist movements before the post, the age of post-feminism had attained their goals of true economic, social, and political gender equality. So when we sometimes, when we say post-feminism, it means that feminism was realized, but it's not, okay? So we are, we, there's still a lot that needs to be done in terms of women's rights globally. The Me Too movement provokes conversations about sexual harassment, gender violence, about the fact that South African women live in poverty than South African men, and there's lack of equal access to reproductive health care worldwide. There's lots of things that we need to think about when we talk about feminism or post-feminism. The term post-feminism reflects a dissatisfaction with previous feminist movements as a myth designed to convince women of their freedom, where in reality there is still a lot of work to do to fight for gender equality. Okay, so we need to challenge, we need to describe the challenges that women face in contemporary society. Feminism needs to be extended to reflect changing cultural and socioeconomic conditions, which was not reflected before in previous forms of feminism. So feminism can be, can be described as happening in three waves. The first was in the 19th and 20th century, and it focused on low legal and social issues within various societies. It was the right for women to vote and therefore referred to as the women's suffrage movement. Notably, the movement was problematic in that it did not take into account the contentious race and class politics at the time. Okay, So they didn't focus on that. It was mainly about white women. Second wave feminism, which can be traced back to the period after the Second World War, focused on workplace, sexuality, and reproductive rights. <coughs> <coughs> oh, 
Although second wave feminism has been widely critiqued for its focus on predominantly white middle class concerns, many women who contributed to the second wave were also participants in the black civil rights movements in the US, together with many other minority groups fighting for freedom. Third wave feminism began in the 1990s and is arguably, arguably still in effect today and is comprised of multiple feminist outlooks including ecofeminism and intersectional feminism. Ecofeminism is a movement that draws connections between the exploitation of the Earth's natural resources and the exploitation of women. Okay. Intersectionalist, intersectional feminism is a movement that argues for the recognition that different women experience different levels of oppression in society and that this difference is often determined by race, class, sexual, or a combination of these. I think that's supposed to be sexuality. Questions, comments about post-feminism? <coughs> post-feminism first appeared as a concept in the 1990s and, and has been described as marking a divide between old ways of thinking about women's rights and new ways of thinking about women's rights. Anne Brooks writes that the term post-feminism can be understood as a useful conceptual frame of reference encompassing the intersection of feminism with a number of other anti-foundational movements, including post-modernism, post-structuralism, and post-colonialism. Brooks further argues that the prefix post does not refer to moving beyond or negation of previous movements, but rather a process of ongoing transformation and change. In this understanding of the term, post-feminism shares certain conditions and positions with third wave feminism. Postmodernism, providing fertile ground, fertile ground for the growth of the post-feminist movement, particularly in its celebration of difference and refusal of grand narratives. Okay, so the post-feminist woman is characterized as strong, independent, characteristics that have found their way into marketing strategies in popular media. <coughs> While these characteristics are not in themselves negative, they function as marketing tools, situates them with the, within the realm of consumerism and consumer culture. So we find a lot of these characteristics in advertising and marketing. In other words, the media represents or presents an image of what a strong independent woman looks like and then promotes the consumer products that enable a woman to embody this persona. Women are encouraged to associate certain brands or consumer goods with the characteristics of a strong independent woman. According to Benet Weiser and Portwood Stasa, post feminism boldly claims that women possess active political agency and subjectivity, yet the primary place in which this agency is recognized and legitimized is within individual consumption habits as well as within general consumer culture. So this means that although contemporary media representations of women can be more seen as more positive, they can also be viewed as aggressive marketing strategies designed to increase consumerism rather than indicators or, of social or political changes within gender relations. So we need to think about that. This idea that women are stronger, that change is coming, is it a real, is it really happening within the places that it needs to be happening or is it just happening within marketing and advertising campaigns, et cetera. So women are encouraged to focus on individual progress rather than collective struggle. And that's very true because most of it we see coming out of America. One of the effects of post-feminism in the media was the sexualization of culture, evident in a growing preoccupation with sexual practices, desires, identities, and the emergence of new, type, new types of sexual experiences. Post-feminism signal, signals a shift from objectivization to subjectivization. 
Objectivization, and especially the sexual objectivization of women of color when women are treated as mere objects or things that exist solely for the pleasure of men. Subjectivization occurs when someone makes up their mind about something according to their personal tastes, interests, or desires. In this way, med some media goes from objectifying women's sexuality for the benefit of men to showing women that embrace their sexuality for themselves. The idea of post-feminism appeared in the 1990s in South Africa and included the version of the new South Africa and it was a move toward greater gender equality reflected in the Women's Charter and in the Constitution and Bill of Rights. During apartheid, the media was subject to censorship and suppression. After apartheid, the media was freed from these restraints and entered a global sphere of advertising and media campaigns. The post-feminist image of femininity that permeated the international media market was imported to South Africa through advertising. That's how we got this image. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, and then if you see on pages of, I think it is, uh, 118, they speak about brands and they just speak about Jill, or oh, sorry, not Jill, Gill, okay? And oh, sorry about this, there's a advertising campaign there that you can read about at the bottom. Uh, yes, PD, your question? <coughs> uh, yes, ma'am, uh, my question is for the, the assignment, ma'am. Yes. yes. So, for the opinion piece, ma'am, do we structure it the same way as we structure a an essay? So what I want to say to you is that you need to look at the rubric, okay? So please yes. consult the rubric. What does the rubric say, Pindi? Pindi, do you know what it says? Hello? Oh, sorry, ma'am, I forgot to unmike. Uh, I'm going to look at the rubric now. Okay. So let me open up mine as well. I'll stop sharing. Uh, is there anyone else with any other questions? PD, how much did you, did you pass your first assessment? You can send me a direct uh, message. Here, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I got 91% oh, for okay. my first assessment. Very good, very good. So which question were you asking me about? Um, I'm not sure which question it is because when I was making notes um, on Monday, I, I didn't, I, I was just, thinking about the assignment. I didn't look what question it was. I was just making notes. Uh, okay, because I don't see what you're talking about here. So have a look in the rubric uh, because the first, it's an essay. The second, we're talking about post-structuralism in the radio industry. The third, we're talking about media theory, which we did do. The fourth one, the third one, we're talking about globalization and identity. Okay, and just look basically at what the rubric is asking from you. Okay, okay thank you, ma'am. Okay, cool. Sorry, I was supposed to be sharing this or not. Uh, okay, guys, so next week, we're going to continue with this idea of 